Good night. Welcome to Cut Deep. It's season three, episode seven. The concept of Cut Deep was developed with a focus on encouraging the wider public to think more in depth on issues that plague us, encouraging persons to have a voice and to use that voice to invoke change. Cut Deep is an interactive platform cutting through the noise and political rhetoric. It is raw, uncut, challenging you to think critically. What do the issues mean for us? What part do we play? It is a platform that will move the Virgin Islands toward unified, integrated success. I want to welcome back Blossoms Florist and McKelly's Beauty Salon as our support sponsors for Cut Deep Season 3. I welcome Basics and Mr. Nice Guy to our roster of sponsors for Season 3. I also want to highlight and thank those of you who support this platform from behind the scenes. Thank you. Tonight, I have a special guest in studio, and we're going to discuss the effects of our closed seaports on our, e our closed seaports, our economy, our tourism sector, and the marine industry. We'll take a short break and come back with our guests for tonight. Our floral experts use their creative flair to design beautiful and exotic bouquets. We are the on-island wedding experts, and for boating enthusiasts, we can help you to add a touch of floral elegance, life, and color to your yacht, mega yacht, both locally and internationally. We've even worked with celebrities. At Blossoms, we continue to deliver smiles and watch our customers bloom. Welcome back. It's season three, episode seven of Cut Deep. Thank you to our sponsors, Blossoms Flores, McKellie's, Basics, and Mr. Nice Guy. Tonight in studio, I have with me Mr. Andrew Ball, newly appointed chairman of the BVI Marine Association. He is no stranger to this set. I want to welcome him back and catch up with him in his new position and what's been happening with the marine sector. Andrew, my friend, welcome to Cut Deep, or welcome back to our set. How have you been? Surviving. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Barely surviving or surviving? Surviving. 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 Okay, for our guests, our um, listening audience, can you just reintroduce yourself or introduce yourself sure. to everyone? Um, my name is Andrew Ball, and I am the newly elected, now chairman of the Marine Association of the BVI. Uh, and our aim is to uh, effectively speak for the marine industry uh, and bring everybody in as, as one group. Uh, within the industry um, to, to represent as a group. Cool. I was going to ask you a little bit more, but I'll go ahead and ask you that. But you preempted some of my questions. So you've been ju just been appointed last week. Correct. Right. So tell us about the position and talk to us about the Marine Association and what your plans are um, as the head. Okay. Um, so we have a, a, an almost entirely new board of directors this year, uh, and we've just changed our bylaws significantly um, with the interest of uh, giving better representation. Um, as a lot of people know, and a lot of people don't know, um, the marine industry is made up of a number of sort of sub-industries or sectors. And so it, they all have different needs, uh, but they all also have to work together. And so it's very important that they all have representation that is appropriate to them. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of b the big aim this year, obviously, is recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, we all have to work together. Um, the membership has been uh, significantly smaller than it probably should be over the past few years. Uh, but that's also because there hasn't been much need for the association mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a, a renewed resolve this year to really um, bring everybody in. Um, and I really do mean everybody. Um, and so we, we've made a move to make sure that everybody is hopefully well represented uh, in the boardroom, uh, but also in our general meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the second aim of, of, of the sort of restructuring was that uh, one of the main purposes of the Marine Association is to promote uh, education and employment of BV Islanders in the industry. Um, and so we've made a move this year uh, to actually have specifically a representative on the board just for that sole purpose. So in every discussion that we have, somebody is arguing for that, that very purpose, um, which will hopefully help progress that goal as well. Okay. Um, 
you're preempting my questions a little bit, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to dive a little deeper, um, seeing that this is cut deep. And I know that there are questions out there that people would like to hear me answer. Ask. Um, so here we go. There has been a lot of conversation regarding the perceived segregation of the marine sector. How do you intend to change the image and scope of the sector? And how do you intend to integrate the sector? I think um, there are two problems. One is definitely the reality, and I'm, and I'm not belittling that at all. But the other problem is perception. Um, I think that the, the industry is at least in part misunderstood. Um, and so I, I think you kind of answered your own question there. The, the answer is integration. Um, and, and again, that's part of the reason for this renewed push to get everybody together. Um, it, it, it literally, everybody is welcome. Uh, the website just went live about two hours ago. Um, and so we will be making a renewed push to get everybody in. Uh, if you're listening, www.marineassociationofthebvi.com. Everybody can sign up and it's free for the first year. Uh, we, we really just want everybody working together. Uh, so wh who, who signs up? It, like who, who is the target market and any business, just explain any, any business that relies on the marine industry for a living. Uh, so not just charter companies, not people that just work on boats, mm -hmm. um, you know, provisioners mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, anybody that their, their, their business is bars, restaurants. You know, you think about all of the, the bars in Joost van Dyke or the mm -hmm. restaurants up in Anagata. Because are, I don't think that people are thinking that why they're probably hearing marine yeah. and they're thinking, oh, I own a boat or I do charters. I can, this is, what you're saying, it's much wider. It's just all encompassing. This is, a, this is a new change that we've just made okay. in our bylaws. So it's not, it's not what the association was. Okay. Um, but one of the things that we've really realized through the, through the COVID pandemic is that um, it, it's not just the core of the industry that is suffering. It's not just the, the people that are actually directly on the water. It's all mm -hmm. of the people that are fed by those, those tourists mm -hmm. that come uh, or the other areas of the industry. <coughs> and so, you know, again, the, the only way out is through and we want everybody working together. Um, and undoubtedly, there will be discussions where people disagree. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, conflict drives innovation. We, we have to have those varying viewpoints um, in, in order to move forward as a group. Um, and so the idea, again, is to be all inclusive and move forward as a group. Um, and, I, and I think having that internal discussion together uh, will, will hopefully help to solve some of the, uh, the errors in perception, um, which will then in turn help to solve some of the issues in reality as well. Mm -hmm. Are there some type of programs that you're looking at to try to change the image? Yeah, I mean, we're very early days with mm -hmm. the new board, um, but we are looking at uh, some, some PR campaigns, uh, especially to sort of uh, widen, widen the perception of the industry or the accuracy of that perception within the community mm -hmm. uh, for the people that are not directly involved with the industry. Um, but we're also looking at some educational programs as well. Uh, we had a great discussion with some of the organizers of Kids in the Sea last week. Uh, we're hoping to get that program off the ground again with them. Um, and to be clear, it's not our program, it's their program. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think the real secret to all of this is, is community collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be a bit more of a community than mm -hmm. we have been. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, that, you know, that, that spreads to all facets of what we're doing. Um, and so the, the, the big mission right now is let's get everybody in the tent. Let's get talking together. Um, and let's come up with some new solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's also make sure that when we step outside the tent, that we're delivering the, you know, the, the news of, of what's actually happening, not mm -hmm. just what we've heard, not just what we think. But, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> I know the industry is down right now. Well, tourism is down. And uh, the marine sector is a huge part of our tourism uh, sector. But just... Um, I guess maybe when we're on the rebound or <laughs> what are some careers that say Virgin Islanders can look at in terms of becoming more involved in the marine sector? Um, I don't think that there are any careers that are specific to Virgin Islanders. Virgin Islanders should be able well, to Well, if we're talking about anything. integrating and getting them more yeah. involved in the marine sector. I, I think uh, the thing that we, that we really have to remember is that every, everybody starts at the beginning. Mm 
-hmm. right? Um, and so we ca you, you can't expect to uh, you know, walk in the door today and be a captain tomorrow. That mm -hmm. takes, takes training, it takes seat time. Uh, the same with any of the skilled traits. You're not, you're not going to be the, the world's best fiberglass worker or a welder tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody can get started. And actually, I think that we're, we're about to reach a time that is incredibly opportune. Um, you know, as, as we know, a lot of the, um, the employment base was immigrant labor before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those people have now gone home. And so uh, there's going to be a renewed and probably, well, hopefully quite an expedient push mm -hmm. to fill all of those roles again. Um, and obviously, as always, um, the hope is that they will be filled by BV Islanders mm -hmm. and belongers. Um, and so, you know, I think, the, I think the real trick is get yourself out there, get in the door, present mm -hmm. yourself and make sure you're taking advantage of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why I was asking you to just give a, a, just a broad scope of some of the careers that are involved in or jobs right. that are involved in um, the marine sector, for example, I know quite a few Virgin Islanders that are into culinary. Um, they love that. Um, and I don't think they think about being chefs on boats. So I think, I think there's, there's two sides to that. Um, one is that people may not have considered it. Um, the other is that chefing on a boat is not for every chef. And this is, this is a real issue that we've discovered in terms of you know, the, the sort of perceptual issue is that to work in the marine industry, for at least not for every role, but for a lot mm -hmm. of roles, you really have to have a passion for being out there. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you say, I want to be a chef, then I say, okay, do you want to be a chef in a 50 foot by 30 foot space with six other people that you don't know, that you can't leave for a week, you know, and you, you're going to sleep in a, in a small berth, you know, at sea, do you get seasick? You know, um, that's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. The, the important part is, at least to me, is, is not to uh, push people that don't want to do it to do it. It's to make it available to anybody that wants to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, I mean, you know, I will, I will personally put myself out there. If you want to get in and you're feeling that you're not getting in, come find me. I'll help you. Um, it's... Okay. Yeah. Great. Tell us about the website. What can we find on there? Okay. So, uh, it just went live an hour ago. And it's definitely still a little bit of a work in process uh, or in progress. Um, but the bare bones are there. Um, it, it's effectively, a, a, first of all, a member's directory. So you can, you, you should, by the time everybody's on it and logged on, you should be able to find any marine service you need in the BBI. Okay. So it's your, your, your 2021 version of the yellow pages. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, it's also a source of news. It's a source of events. Uh, we do have a forum function on there. I'm not quite sure how we're going to use it yet, but I'm okay. sure we can get creative. Uh, we would like to be able to put some of the rules and regulations as far as coming into the BVI, uh, bringing a boat here, operating here, um, so that some of the, the foreign vessels will know how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, we, we really need to get a, a better grip of, of how it works. It's a, you know, we're in a dynamic situation right now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to put anything out there and have mm -hmm. it be accurate tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the only thing worse than not giving information at all is giving the wrong information. Um, so we're going to be very careful about that. Um, the other thing that's on there, uh, which, again, we're still building up, uh, is all of the different initiatives that we have. Um, so... You know, we've got the, the Parakeet Bay Marine Shelter. Okay. Um, we're, we're doing some work with the college uh, on their marine program, or our, our membership is. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the, the sort of perceptual versus real issues, I know that there has been, in some circles, a bit of a perception that, you know, the marine industry sort of comes and we take, 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 and we don't mm -hmm. give back. Mm -hmm. That's not what I see at all. Okay. Um, the, the difference is that, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that the, the Marine Association specifically does. It's what all of our members do, what all of the charter companies, all of the businesses within the association do. Um, the difference is they don't, they don't claim credit for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, but I guess, too, when we get to know the members of the association and the companies that they work for, then we'll be able to say, oh, yeah, but this company gives here and there. And sometimes it's not with the Marine Association, exactly. but individually. But that's, that's part of the PR aspect. Right. I, I find that a lot of these people are not, not keen to take credit. Mm -hmm. um, but when there's a negative perception out there and it's actually counting against us, then I think we kind of have to. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so um, I'm hoping that we can make, make everybody's contributions a little bit more public there. Um, and obviously through social media as well. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the, the crude yachts, they have a pack for a purpose program. And they tell all of their guests when they fly down, bring a bunch of stuff in your bag, whether it's for FSN, whether it's for the kids right. in school, or, you mm -hmm. know, how many people know about this? Mm -hmm. Not many. And they've done their own PR as well. Don't mm -hmm. let me belittle that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I mean, we've got, within the industry, we have so many people that go out and volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there, I did a, when COVID hit, we did a little research on this and I actually sent an email around and sort of said to everybody, what, what do you do? Tell me what you do. And I, I had the intent of doing some PR on it. And the response I got was so overwhelming mm -hmm. that I couldn't really collate it all to get it out. Right. Um, so we, we kind of stepped back and, and said, okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll just do, sort of do a time release. We'll just keep up with it from now. Don't worry about what we've already done. Um, but I mean, the other thing is that there are probably pr plenty of initiatives out there that could be taken and haven't been taken. Um, and part of this idea of just sort of getting everybody together again is so that people can bring that stuff to the table and they can say, well, actually, I've identified a need over here. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully somebody else in the group is going to say, I have some resources I can put towards that need. Um, it, it's really, it's about community. Mm -hmm. Can um, I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm asking you questions, but <laughs> this popped into my head just now. Um, how many local captains do you know that we have? Um, off the top of my head, probably 20, 25. Okay. Uh, I know there are significantly more than that. Okay. Um, in my role, I don't interact with the captains that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to be one myself long, long ago. Um, now I'm mostly interacting with business owners. Mm -hmm. uh, and the association up until now has been predominantly expat business owners. Uh, a lot of them were granted status after the last election. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we'd really like to get um, more into the, into the BV Islander crowd and get mm -hmm. everybody together. It's a very delicate subject. Very, um, but we want everybody together. Okay. We, don't, we don't want division. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the issue of, of how many local captains do I know, uh, probably not half of them. Uh, you know, in my day job, I investigate accidents when they happen. So mm -hmm. if I know you, it might not be a good thing mm -hmm. if you're a captain. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, um, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily view that as a metric per se. Okay. You done? Good. Yeah. Great. We're going to take a <laughs> short break and come right back. <laughs> Welcome back. It's season three, episode seven of Cut Deep. Thank you to our sponsors, Blossoms Florist, McKellie's Basics, and Mr. Nice Guy. If you're just joining us, I have Andrew Ball, chairman of the Marine Association, in studio with me tonight. We're diving into the marine sector, its position in the BVI, its impact on the economy, and potential damage based on COVID. So I'm just going to get straight back into the questions uh, with my guest for tonight, Andrew. Um, I want to get into some deeper questions, but first just explain the importance of the marine sector to our tourism product. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you said tourism product because there's, there's many different facets to yeah. the marine sector. Um, there are varying statistics um, and actually things have changed a lot even since Irma. Mm -hmm. um, since Irma, uh, the latest statistic I saw in, I think, 2018 or 2019 was that uh, the marine industry, that the yachts, made up 75% of the beds uh -huh. uh, for tourism, for overnight tourism in the uh -huh. territory. 
Uh, obviously that number wasn't quite so high, I think it was always a majority, but it wasn't quite so high before some of the big resorts got, got blown away and, and right. you know, they're start of, starting to finish rebuilding now. Mm -hmm. um, in, terms of, in terms of the economy, um, you know, we're looking at, at hundreds of millions of dollars a year, uh, thousands of people employed. Um, I think the, the UN heat report that just came out uh, stated that the uh, tourism economy accounted for, I, I think, 35% of GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing that's 2019. Um, I don't think that, that weighing up beds is particularly, or the percentage of beds we have is a particularly good metric against that because not every bed costs the same amount of money. Right. Um, but as a simple metric, um, you know, that, that's a, a staggering percentage. That's, that's more than a fifth of the entire GDP. Mm -hmm. um, at least. And so it is, it is a huge contribution. Um, I know it's, not, it, it's often not seen that way uh, because it's not direct government revenue. Um, th there is direct government revenue, mm -hmm. but the GDP is obviously different. Um, I, I, and a lot of this is, uh, it's, it's sort of passed through the community. It's, you know, you're, you're, somebody charters a yacht, um, you know, they come here, they spend money at the grocery store, they go to all the bars. Uh, you've got to pay the cleaners and the fuel and everything else on the boat. And you've got to buy the parts for the boat. You've got to repair the boat. And so it all sort of sinks in that way. It's, it's not necessarily the most direct mm -hmm. method. But it is a huge part of the economy um, and obviously significantly diminished right now. Um, okay. So how, how, how would you say this sector is coping right now? Um, Right now, uh, the latest numbers that I was given uh, was that we were at about one and a half percent occupancy. So that's one and a half out of a hundred. Um, it's very rare that we would operate a hundred percent occupancy. Um, it, you know, that means that the docks are empty. And the closest we'll get to that is sort of New Year's. Mm -hmm. New Year's week is probably the busiest time. Um, and so 100% occupancy is, is a little bit unattainable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not uncommon to think that we'd have at least 70% out there yeah. uh, in, in the busiest of times. 1.5% obviously does not sustain the industry at all. Um, most of the charter companies have undergone a, a period, a, an extensive period now, of massive cash burn. Um, and, and I'm quite... I'm, I'm quite proud of the industry uh, in the way that it has fought to keep its employees. Mm -hmm. um, not every company has been the same, mm -hmm. um, but it, most of the, the operators I know have, uh, when somebody a little bit more cutthroat might have let their staff go uh, in order to save cash to survive, um, they've kept their staff maybe on reduced hours, mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, they found, they found other means. Um, they've taken on debt, sold assets, whatever. Um, people are struggling. Um, and those are the people that we see. Um, and I'm led to believe that there are other people that we don't see that have, have lost their employment, mm -hmm. um, who are obviously are struggling a whole lot more. So it's, uh, it's not a great time. Yeah. Um, as can be imag imagined, um, I want to talk about the um, issue with the boats leaving. St. Thomas is booming. They're it bragging. Is. They're happy. Um, <laughs> just talk to us about that really quickly. Um, St. Thomas is booming. Um, I'm, I'm told that there are most anchorages there. It's pretty hard to find a spot now. Yeah. Um, the, the, a number of charter companies have, have worked to move some of their boats uh, elsewhere. Um, we have to remember that the charter companies mostly don't own the boats. Mm -hmm. They all have individual owners. Mm -hmm. And those owners often have loans against mm -hmm. these boats. Um, so they need to make an income in order to pay the loan. Um, so it's not, it's not about hating on the BVI. It's about survival for them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a number of charter companies have moved uh, boats from here. They've opened up new bases elsewhere. It's not just St. Thomas. Uh, boats have gone to the Bahamas. They've gone to St. Martin. They've gone to Grenada. Some of them have even been shipped to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's sort of redistributing to, to get what they can out of, out, of, out of their assets so that they can survive. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a, a natural reaction in the market. The, the real issue is... Uh, so is it due to the decisions that are being made? It's due to 
or seaports remaining closed, the restrictions to get in here. Why are they leaving? I think, leaving? I think there's, there's two sides to this. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're leaving for, <laughs> doesn't really work for the sea, but greener pastures, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, bluer waters, I guess. <laughs> um, but th they're leaving because there's somewhere else they can go and make money. Um, obviously, we're in a pandemic. It's not all about money. There does have to be a balance, I think. Uh, and I think we could do more to meet that balance. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the uh, one issue is the fact that people are leaving or investment is leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, the more important issue, not to say it's not important, but the more important issue uh, is what kind of an impression are we leaving with our investment base? Mm -hmm. um, are we going to attract inward investment in the future? And so there's a lot of anger out there right yeah. now. And it, it's not... Some of it is about the way that we've made decisions as a country, um, but it's a hard time and there's hard decisions to be made. Um, the other side is about the way that we've made those com decisions or we've communicated those decisions, mm -hmm. or in some cases not communicated mm -hmm. those decisions. And so the issue with the ports to me is, is, yes, obviously we want the ports open, we need the ports open in order to survive. Um, there's other hurdles after opening the port. I mean, we have to figure out testing capacity and everything right. else. Um, it's not going to be... It, opening the port wasn't going to be a silver bullet. We're still in a pandemic. Um, and so I think there were some unfair expectations of that as well. But the fact that... I mean, even it was, after a year? Yeah. Still unfair expectations? Uh, after unfa a year? Unfair expectations within what our abilities are right now. Okay. Um, Preparation could have moved us along a little bit more, perhaps. Okay. Um, but again, that's about communication. And, and being told this a week before, you know, um, it, it just, it, it doesn't, days. it doesn't, four, mm -hmm. four days. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. It all kind of blends together at this point. <laughs> and and I'll, be, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't really expecting them to open. Neither me. Um, but, but like you say, it's many, about communication many words. It is. and... <laughs> Planning. I think Invest I, I say that we don't have a COVID confidence. problem. We have a management problem. Okay. Yeah. I'm letting you do the cut and deep today. Yeah. But the, <laughs> I mean, the investment is about confidence, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, if we want people to be confident, we, we, have to, we have to set goals. We have to achieve goals. We have to, we have to be consistent. Totally and, agree. And we're not doing that. Yeah. You know, um, you, when you bet money on a horse at a horse race, you bet on the sure thing, Right. Right. You know, you don't bet on the slow guy, the slow horse at the back of the pack. Right. And look for um, a miracle. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I mean, I think you've touched on the losses that the sector has experienced or is experiencing. I don't think I could do them justice. I indeed. will or will continue <laughs> for how long do you think? Um, realistically, our season is coming to an end. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's March now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but bookings take time to organize. People have to book in advance. They have to plan travel. And that's, that's difficult enough in normal times, let alone now. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, my, my hope for a sort of uptick in business is the beginning of next season now. Okay. So December. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be working as hard as we can to revive what we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is some business through the summer normally. Um, yeah. If there is a resurgence in the global economy now, there, there might be all sorts of people that, that Looking to travel just out. really want to travel. Yeah. And they've missed this place for so long, they want to get back. You know, maybe the summer could be booming yeah. if we're ready. But the point is, to be ready, we need to be doing everything we can now. The management problem keeps raising its head. So, <laughs> so what, what does a rebound look like to you? Do you think... <laughs> is that a right question? Um, a rebound. Yeah, uh, recovery. Recovery, probably better term. I don't know. Um, I, I think it, it, a lot of what happens here depends on what happens in the rest of the world. Um, the important part here is that we have some dynamic plans so that we can adapt to what may happen in the rest of the world. We're seeing vaccines getting pushed out now. Um, uh, we should probably have a plan for how we're going to treat things if we achieve herd immunity here. And I think that is a huge, a huge part of moving towards some sort of a proper reopening. Um, 
we have to present some level of safety. Um, the, you know, the, the, the things that are really prohibiting us right now are the controls that we have. And I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to delve too deep on the controls because I, ha I have some personal feelings and it's, it's all over the place because we do have to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a really tough balance. Mm -hmm. And I think I said on your show last year at some point that I really don't envy the people that have to make these decisions. Right. Um, j just because I don't agree with them doesn't mean I don't necessarily respect them sometimes. Um, and so it's, um, it, I, I think... Moving, moving towards uh, a mostly vaccinated population, or for those that want to take it, mm -hmm. uh, even just moving to a point where everybody that, has, that wants the, op the vaccine has had the opportunity to take it, then at least you can sort of say, okay, well, you, everybody's had a choice now. You know, it's time to move forward. Okay. Um, so we need, to, we need to get there so that we can reduce the restrictions. The restrictions are the, the, the biggest hurdle that I see. There's some logistical stuff with travel, obviously. Um, but the biggest reason, the, the biggest piece of feedback I'm getting from people about, you know, why they're not coming is, well, I just don't, I don't want to come and go through all of that. Yeah. Um, we need to be able to make our, our product accessible. Um, and so it, it's that much harder when we have the USVI right next door, which has very minimal restrictions. Um, you know, it, it's how do you compete? Um, to an extent, we can sell some additional safety. We can sell some additional seclusion, um, and I think all the charter companies are are working on that as hard as they can. Yeah, and and they are getting some positive response on that, but one point five percent is not enough. Yeah, um, no, it's not enough. It's far from enough. I saw, if we're talking about the vaccine for a moment, I saw um, a couple people asking online, potential visitors, they were saying that they had taken the vaccine. And if they still had to quarantine and, you know, all of that. Um, I mean, again, <coughs> the information coming forward from the, administ the government administration is zero to none. Uh, so you're not sure what's happening. But the international uh, organizations are telling you that once you're taking the vaccine, you don't have to quarantine or... That so... I, I am by no means a medical professional, mm -hmm. um, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, I guess. Um, the, the way I'm informed is that just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean that you can't spread the virus. You're less likely to do it. Right. But, but really, our restrictions are not about the safety of the individual that's coming here. They've already chosen to travel. They've chosen to come here. They've chosen to take that risk. Mm -hmm. It's about the safety of all the people that are already here. Mm -hmm. um, and so... The, if, if there is still a risk that they could bring a virus in with them and they could transmit it, um, then fair enough. Uh, I, I think the real point is that we have to protect ourselves mm -hmm. and make sure that we've got our safeguards in place. Yeah. So at that point, it doesn't even, well, I mean, it will matter if somebody with COVID comes in, but you know what I mean? Right. It, you know, the, the risk is that much more diminished. What would you say to encourage um, residents to take the vaccine? Um, well, I was, I was one of the first to take it here, actually. Um, I'm also a member of Visor, um, and so we, we were enabled as first responders to get the vaccine. Um, and um, it, it's, to me, it, it's, it's not about me, it's about everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was a little uncomfortable um, afterwards, but highly worth it. I'm sure I'd be a whole lot more uncomfortable if I had COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it enables uh, not just me to get on with my business, but it enables everybody else to get on with their business. Um, it, it, is, it is a step forward in keeping everybody else safe, uh, but also uh, you know, moving the economy forward for everybody else. And, with and that, so with is, that information, and I think that's a little bit of the problem maybe with the vaccine. Yes, there are people who are going to... The other information is going to be there. It's, it's just the way of the world and the way we think. But um, government isn't forthcoming with information, the importance on why we should take the vaccine, how it's going to benefit the economy. Are we going to be able to open up the economy, the seaports um, or borders? Like, I think if people knew and understood their position to our recovery, then they'd be a little more... Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I, I can't really speak as to what their position is because I don't, I don't know either. Um, but what I, what I will say is, 
I wish I knew. It would, it would, you know, from the basis of investment and from the basis of... I think we all wish we knew. Just, yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> we, we need to be able to make a plan. To survive we need, <laughs> economically, we need to be able to make a plan. Um, and so, you know, nobody's, nobody's going to say... It is a dynamic situation. It, it is, it is ever-changing. So nobody's going to say, well, you said this and we're going to hold you to it. Correct. If you've got a good reason to change your mind, then, then fair enough. Um, but... The only way that I, I really think we're going to solve this, and this is very reminiscent of last time I was on your show, is, is that we all need to work together and we need mm -hmm. to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the part that I've found most frustrating over the past year um, is, is the, the sort of public-private relationship. Um, and, you know, we have had, we have had a few meetings mm -hmm. with government. Different, different sectors have met with, with caucus. And mm -hmm. uh, we've had some, some good discussions. Um, the deliverables from those discussions weren't necessarily realized. Uh, but again, it's a dynamic situation. The, the problem really is that there hasn't been any follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a number of, of smaller issues, um, a huge number of smaller issues mm -hmm. surrounding COVID that we're, mm -hmm. we're all trying to work around. I mean, we've got immigration stuff, we've yeah. got health stuff, we've got customs stuff, we've got... Uh, and so we're trying to work through all of that, but there's, n there's not a lot of forthcoming responses to, to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, and so the first step is to sort of offer a solution and say, okay, you know, we're not getting any response here. You know, maybe this is, this is a complex problem. Um, okay, what about if we tried this? You know, let's help each other. And there's still nothing. Um, and so, and I, I, I want to be careful about generalizing there because there are some government departments who have been very responsive and have been great. Um, but there are others that, you know, we have issues that are, are timely and we just can't, we're not getting through. Um, uh, you know, as we know in the BVI, it's, it's, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Um, and so I think as a, as a bit more of a grassroots approach, that's, that's part of the idea of, of creating the marine industry is a bit more of a tight community and an all-encompassing community, mm -hmm. um, is that everybody's aware of each other's problems and everybody's working to solve each other's problems mm -hmm. because it affects everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a short break and come right back. Is business slow? Cash flow down? Hosting an upcoming event? We can help. Advertise with 284 Media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies. Allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest. This could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284media at cctbbi.com. Advertising with us works. Welcome back. It's season three, episode seven of Cut Deep. Thank you to our sponsors, Blossoms Flores, McKellie's Basics, and Mr. Nice Guy. <clears throat> We're back with my guest, Andrew Ball. And I'm just, I have two more questions for you, Andrew, and then I'm going to release you. Okay. <laughs> uh, these are maybe two big questions. I hope you don't kill me or think <laughs> that I've thrown you under the bus, but... What is your take on the commission of inquiry? Um, ooh, show is called Cut Deep. Um, <laughs> I, I, think I, can, I think I can feel confident saying that I'm, I'm in favor of a commission of inquiry. Um, my reasoning being that if the commission of inquiry is what it says it is, and it's an independent in investigation, mm -hmm. and that's it, mm -hmm. um, then Nobody has anything to worry about. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't have anything to hide, nobody has anything to worry about. Um, there's, since I've, I got here in 2009, mm -hmm. and since I've been here, there has always been this sort of discussion about corruption. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it is it's disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, and so, ultimately, if, if we really can have an independent commission um, that comes in and, and says, OK, you've got nothing to worry about, Great, then we've got nothing to worry about. If they say we have something to worry about, then at least we can admit it and move on and do something about it. Yeah. Um, I would like nothing more than the COI to come back and say, you don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but that, it, it's up to them to determine whether we do have a problem. Yeah, cool. Cutting shallow. Cutting shallow, real shallow. <laughs> He's cutting shallow. But I'm going to ask him this last question and uh, we'll go from there. Do you think we have a race problem in the BVI? Uh, that's a very delicate question. Um, I think we have 
some form of social segregation here. Mm. Um, and, and the question is, um, it, it's as to how much of that is based on reality and how much of that is based on perception. Mm. Um, you know, I have friends who say I'm, I'm not comfortable coming here or not comfortable going there. Um, and and as, I, as, as I go there, I sort of say, well, actually, there's nothing to be uncomfortable about. It's a perception thing. Um, but again, the only way we, we really beat that is to, to hit it head on um, and, and sort of fight it together. Um, creating more division over it isn't, isn't going to solve the problem. Um, I don't know what else I can really say on that. Well, I mean, you're going there. Uh, I was going to ask you, how, how do you think that we can begin to bridge or fix those perceived... I th I, actually, I don't, I don't think it's that difficult. Really? Um, I, 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 I think it's a, it's a state of mind. It's, it's a decision that everybody has to make just to be bigger. Um, I, I, I hope that's not too controversial. Well, um, humankind isn't naturally there will there will always be bigger racists there will always be people that make generalizations based on some factor whether it's right or wrong the important part is that those people are in the minority i mean there's you know there's there's it, it, in some ways it's a sickness um the the important part is that we all work to curb it and control it i think you know we, we kind of have to police ourselves on this or at least as a as a community, mm -hmm. um, it's a very it's a, as a as a white person. It's a very difficult <laughs> issue for me to talk about, and I realize how sort of ironic that is. You know, I, I'm I'm uncomfortable talking about racial issues because of my race. That that doesn't. It's uh, it, it it is. A, I think the the very fact that it, it is it has become so uncomfortable to talk about is part of the reason why we're not solving it. Yeah. But somebody has to step why up. Why do you think you're uncomfortable? Um, perception, again. Uh, it, it's, it's not about... Perception in terms of being judged? Or... Yeah, it, it's not about what I think my message is. It's mm -hmm. about what, How it's received. what other people interpret that as. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there will be people watching the show that, mm -hmm. that go, oh, that guy. You know, and <laughs> that, that's always going to be a thing. <laughs> but until we all decide to just get on with it yeah. and, and work through it, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know how else to explain that. I think it's more of a state of mind than, a, than, than anything. You just, who cares? It, it, it probably you know? is. I mean, I invited you to my birthday party yeah. and you were there. And I, I know you had some reservations and you might have been a little uncomfortable, not wondering how you would have been. It wasn't, it wasn't that I was uncomfortable with or... my surroundings. There were a few people that weren't uh, particularly welcoming. But that's the same in any crowd. Okay. That, that doesn't matter whether it's a black crowd or a white crowd. Okay. That's, that's not based on race. It's always, in any community, there's always going to be people that don't like you. Right. Now, given that those people I don't think know me at all, that was probably based on the color of my skin. But that's a generalization in itself. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you just got to say, well, there's... You're never going to get everybody like you, mm -hmm. you know, sure. but, you know, I, 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 I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of perceptual stuff there. And some of it is, is culturally ingrained in, in, in expats and belongers alike. Yeah. Um, in just, you know, the way that everybody's been sort of programmed as they've grown up, um, you know, there is some sort of underlying programming there but we've all got to just sort of take a step back and think about what we're doing and say is this logical mm -hmm. no it's not mm -hmm. you know we're all people let's let's move forward um and and to be honest i i wasn't gonna go this far um in this country i think it's something that that is really holding us back um and to an extent, I think there are some that use it as a way to divide people and control people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I, th I think, if anything, that alone should be a good motivator just to say, I'm not going to be a sheep and I'm not going to let people control me. It's, um, yeah, I, I think I've gone about as far as I'm going to delve into that <laughs> without getting myself in trouble. Um, yeah.
Wonderful. Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. I know you had to, you know, protect your words a bit, and I appreciate that. Um, tensions can run high real fast. So thank you once again for joining me on set. I'm thank you happy for having me. I'm that you were here this evening to um, assist me in, you know, getting further information out on the marine sector and our tourism industry and how important the marine sector is to our um, tourism industry. So thank you for being on set. I'm going to take a short break and I'm going to come back to discuss some of the pressing issues that were in the news for the past week. Gentlemen, inspiring gentlemen and our partners that hold us down. It's season two of The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, taking you on the most inspiring journey with the best and brightest distinguished gentlemen of the BVI. Raw, real-life lessons that translate to grounded, community-minded, well-rounded men like you've never seen them before. Governor Augustus J.U. Jasper, Jovan Klein, Neil Klein, and so much more. Turning modern-day men into 21st century distinguished gentlemen with yours truly, Ron Grant, a 284 Media Production. Welcome back to Season 3, Episode 7 of Cut Deep. Thank you to our sponsors, Blossoms Flores, McKellie's, Basics, and Mr. Nice Guy. We've had some developments in the news over the past week. Let's discuss. The continued closure of our seaports. Each day, it is clearer and clearer that the elected administration not only came into office without a plan, but continue to show that they have no plan in the face of this pandemic. We do not have a COVID problem, we have a management problem. Or we have a leader with a sinister plan that is sure to screw over the BBI. But I want to let him and his cronies know they won't sit pretty with our, with our money in their bank accounts while the masses suffer. $360,000 per month, $12,000 per day to a badge to secure our borders. Let me tell you what tickled me. The fact that Vino highlighted that the governor sat in cabinet while making this decision. I'm not sure what they were trying to prove. To me, it only proved the point that the UK tries not to overstep in our governance, but a dog gets enough rope to hang itself. Money is assigned for constitutional review. Well, it's great to see some movement in this front, on this front. Albeit, it is more spending by the administration that thinks our money is bottomless. Again, my opinion and advice is to start with a referendum to ascertain the people's position on the future of the BVI. Virgin Islanders, keep your eyes on this administration. Can anyone explain to me the reason the Premier, the premier found it in good form to write to CARICOM and other territories about our commission of inquiry? And their response, utterly hilarious and embarrassing. It would have been great if they sent back advice as to how not to repeat their corrupt, wicked ways and how not to damn and how not to damn his people to a life of hell as this seems to be our premier's trajectory. Talking him off that ledge would have been welcomed advice. Every week, contracts upon contracts are signed spending money frivolously, yet our children cannot get back to a normal school routine. Works can begin on the Rotong jetty to ensure our supports open to save what little we have left of our economy and our dignity and the dignity of our people. I do not know how to express to us as a people that we've hit bottom. We continue to move around like zombies in a matrix. Here is the fact. We could wake up tomorrow morning and the news reads BVI Constitution suspended and there would be nothing any one of us could do about it. We are at the bottom. Our way of life would be forever impacted and we could all take a bow. We are in the month of March, a month where we celebrate Women's History Month around the world. During this month, on each weekly episode of Cut Deep, I will highlight seven female stalwarts of these beautiful Virgin Islands. Tonight, our seven are Mrs. Millicent Mercer, veteran school teacher and sports enthusiast, 
1971, she was the first female to stand for elected office. Ivory Shinnery, our first festival queen. She won that title in 1954. Honorable Eileen Parsons, OBE, and Honorable Ethelyn Smith, first females elected to our Legislative Assembly. They were duly elected in 1995, shattering that glass ceiling to usher in what is to come. Honorable Dancia Penn, Sala, OBE, QC. First Virgin Islander and female to hold the position of Attorney General. She held the position from 1992 to 1997. She was also the first female Deputy Governor. Rita Fred Georges, RN MBE, first person to sit at the women's desk. She encouraged us to look at mental wellness and her work was observed by the Pan American Health Organization in 1982. Her work started the women's desk in 1992, now known as Gender Affairs. Honorable Dame Janice Pereira, DBE, first Virgin Islander and female to hold the position of Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Courts. We salute and celebrate these women. Thank you for tuning in with me tonight, and I will see you next week for a whole new episode.